We've arrived at day four of the 2021 Aspen Ideas Festival. I'm Zinclea Samoa, or at Simply Zinclea Online. We hope you enjoy today's breakout sessions and are excited about the plenary happening tonight. I know I am. 2021 is the 17th convening of this festival, a time set aside each summer for us to explore possibilities, problems, and solutions, and open ourselves up to new ways of thinking. Last year, necessity became opportunity, and what was once a very much in-person experience became something bigger and more inclusive. We're thrilled to have you join us here online. Our broad theme this year is American futures, and we've got plenty of that this evening. We'll begin with H.R. McMaster, who will talk about the magical thinking that has gotten our approach to China relations a bit off track. Next, we'll talk about how the country still hasn't come to grips with our legacy of slavery and how we won't be able to move forward until we do. And then Priscilla Chan will debut a new way for students and teachers to communicate. If you're thinking globally, then China likely is on your mind. But the way American consumers and players have been thinking about the country may be based on some faulty assumptions. Former General H.R. McMaster joins The Atlantic's Jeffrey Goldberg to talk about what we're getting wrong and how we can get it right. Uh, hi, and welcome to this session of the Virtual Aspen Ideas Festival. Uh, I'm Jeffrey Goldberg. I'm the editor-in-chief of The Atlantic. Uh, I'm usually out at Aspen at this uh, point in the year, but uh, we're, we're having a conversation uh, today uh, remotely with H.R. McMaster, uh, former National Security Advisor to President Trump, uh, former Army General, current Hoover Institution Fellow, uh, and also a lecturer at Stanford University's Business School, uh, an expert on many things. We're going to talk today mainly about the largest foreign policy issue, I think, uh, facing the United States, possibly through this century, uh, which is the rise of China. Uh, so uh, first of all, welcome to the conversation. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for wearing a tie. Uh, very un-Aspen-like, but that's okay. This year you get, a, you get a pass. I still have my Zoom Lululemon pants on, though, Jeff. Just a little bit, t maybe TMI for you, but... Yeah, yeah. Well, no, we're going to leave that. We're going to we're going to hide. We're, we're just going to we're, we're going to we're going to make believe that that didn't happen. And we're just going to just going to go right in. Uh, hey, people do all kinds of crazy things in a pandemic. Um, so so just look, start us off by by contextualizing this. Um, I, I asserted my own view that um, by far and away the the, the the major challenge facing the United States uh, over the next decades, if not through the century, um, is going to be the rise of China and particularly China's global aspirations, because we haven't as a country, um, seen a, seen another country with global aspirations, uh, since the demise of the Soviet Union. So, so, so frame this out. Am, am I being over dramatic, or, or is this, uh, to your mind, uh, a, 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 a paramount challenge facing the United States foreign policy making. Uh, Jeff, I think it's the defining competition of, of this century. And it's not just because it's the rise of China, right? We want China to succeed, but it's really the policies of the Chinese Communist Party, and especially now how aggressive China has become in exporting its authoritarian mercantilist model, even as it extends and tightens its exclusive grip on power internally through brutal means, in, including a, a campaign of, of slow genocide in Xinjiang and the extension of the party's repressive arm into Hong Kong and, and of course, this race to perfect a technologically enabled Orwellian police state. Right, right. Let's pause on something you said because I want to get a definition um, and, and I want you to answer a question about that definition. The definition I want is authoritarian mercantilist uh, policy, set of policies. Um, tell us what you mean by that and, and if you could also answer this this question, which I think is um, which I think is out there. There, there. there was always this assumption that if China opened up, if its economy opened up, politics would open up and society would open up in in turn. Um, sounds to me, based on uh, what you're saying and also what I've read from you, that you don't believe that that the opening has obviously happened. But talk about what do you mean by an authoritarian mercantilist state, and is that very different from a communist expansionist state. Yeah. Well, it, it, it is different, uh, but it's also the same in, in, a lot, in a lot of ways. I mean, it is a Leninist model, a Leninist model based on 
on uh, on Xi Jinping thought on socialism with Chinese com- uh, Ch- Chinese characteristics, which if you can get through, essentially means hey, the people don't have a say in how they're governed. The party has absolute power. There is no such thing as rule of law. I mean, you can read speeches by Xi Jinping on rule of law. What he means is the opposite of rule of law. You have, I think, in in China this this Orwellian reversal of the truth going on every day. Uh, it believe it, it is a it is a, an, an approach to governing that means that you're not allowed to criticize the government. You're not allowed uh, to 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 exercise any degree of, of freedom of speech. There's no due process of, of, of law, and this model is being exported. I mean, if you look at Zimbabwe, is the perfect client state for China, right? Because they've been able to establish the same means of of population control, the same effort to extinguish what we r- would regard as as unalienable rights. Uh, I think if you look at other states that have adopted this kind of authoritarian model, it's it's on the Korean Peninsula, north of the 38th parallel, uh, and it's countries like Cam- Cambodia, Laos, and so forth. And and so I think what we can see is really tangible examples of if China succeeds in exporting this model, that the world will be less free, less prosperous, and less safe. You, you stay with this on, uh, for one one more one more round because it sounds like what you're describing is a country that has the authoritarian tendencies of the Soviet Union, but a functioning or highly functioning economy, unlike the Soviet Union. So this is a, so, so is what we're seeing from your perspective, a completely new model? It's, it's, a, it's a new model. It's sadly been enabled by, by us and, and our flawed assumptions about the nature of the Chinese Communist Party and the belief in particular that as China was welcomed into the international economic order, this is the, the aspect of, the, of this challenge that makes it, I think, uh, fundamentally different from the challenge that we faced with the Soviet Union during the Cold War, for example. But the assumption was that China would play by the rules. And then as China prospered, it would liberalize its economy. It would, and then it would liberalize its form of governance. It, it didn't do that. And what China has been able to do is to use our free market economic system against us with a statist model, right, that invests in not only state-owned enterprises, but heavily subsidizes so-called private companies in China. It combines that uh, those unfair economic practices with a sustained campaign of industrial espionage under Made in China 2025. There's a program for it, actually. And then the integration of, 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 um, of military and civilian enterprise in such a way uh, that China, as it extracts sensitive technology and intellectual property, applies that to gaining what, what, it, what it hopes will be a preponderant advantage in, in the emerging data-driven global economy and in advanced manufacturing, but also a differential advantage uh, over the rest of the world militarily uh, as well. Now, there are a lot of people, obviously, who would say that people who hold your views, which are hawkish, um, are overstating the case. You're looking for a new Soviet threat. You're, you know, that, 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 that you, we're... And, and this, is, this has just come up in, actually, in, in nuclear posture review. Um, it's now the position of the Pentagon that China is becoming a strategic nuclear threat as opposed to a regional nuclear threat. What do you say to the critics who say that, uh, that, that China actually could work with us and that our policies are creating a more recalcitrant Xi Jinping? Yeah. <laughs> well, this is what I call in, in, in battlegrounds, Jeff, strategic narcissism, right? This tendency to define the world only in relation to us. And to think that, you know, Xi Jinping and the Chinese Communist Party, they, they have no aspirations beyond what they do in reaction to us. Actually, they have fears and emotions and aspirations and an ideology of their own. Uh, and so I think what we have to do is, first of all, listen to what Xi Jinping says, right? Because he has been defining this competition mainly in ideological terms. And then we have to watch what they do. So I would just give you a quick rundown, right? How about foisting COVID-19 on the world? How about suppressing any anybody, uh, going after anybody who tried to really ring the alarm bells? These are journalists and, and doctors. How about insult to injury with wolf warrior diplomacy? Hey, what about that campaign of genocide in Xinjiang? How about the extension of the party's repressive arm in, in, into Hong Kong? How about bludgeoning Indian soldiers to death on the Himalayan frontier? Or the campaign of economic coercion against Australia? Or the, the largest land grab in history if they succeed in the South China Sea? Did the United States you know, make Xi Jinping do all that? I don't think so. Let me, um, at the risk of going into a cul-de-sac, you, you mentioned the virus, the pandemic. Um, you seem to have a very hard line on, uh, on China's responsibilities in this. Can you talk about that for one second? Just because it's obviously 
especially the lab issue has sure. come back yeah. uh, in force in, in, in recent right. weeks. Well, I just think it's clear from the timeline, Jeff. I mean, this has been laid out so clearly, right? This is, you know, this is suppressing the news of human to human transmission. This is like, uh, you know, like with the SARS epidemic, you know, a lack of cooperation, a lack of transparency, you know, the, the shutting down of, of domestic travel before international travel. Uh, the, the sowing of all these you know, kind of conspiracy theories to deflect blame, right? The, the lack of, of, of transparency, even just, you know, even just a, a month or so ago, when the World Health Organization uh, investigative team arrived in China. So, you know, I, I think when you add all that up, I think you have to come to the conclusion that at least I would be surprised if it didn't come from a lab. Otherwise, you know, why would China go to such great pains to, to cover it up and to impede any effort? Do you, have any, do you have any evidence that this came from the lab as opposed to oh, it's, <clears throat> animal to human transmission? It's all the evidence that you s saw, Jeff, right? The fact that there isn't, you know, that there isn't evidence of, of, of a transmission through through an animal, an animal carrier, uh, that, that, which typically is the case you find that, you know, the fact that you know, the, those two labs were there uh, in Wuhan doing that, doing that kind of research. You know, you saw the, you know, obviously the, the State Department cable that predated uh, the, the pandemic warning of, of low standards and then i think you just look at the you know kind of the circumstantial evidence of the way the parties handled this so so i'm i mean i'm, I'm like you i'm reading everything i can about it and, and trying to come to a judgment i have not come to a judgment yet but i if i had to bet right now i, I would bet in in a leak from a lab so let, let me ask you a question it sounds like you're describing um inevitable collisions between two superpowers the dominant superpower and the rising superpower uh are there any off ramps here? Yeah, Jeff, I think, it's, I think it's the, the opposite. Yeah, I think it's the opposite. It's not inevitable, right? In fact, I think the old strategy of cooperation and engagement with China under the assumption that China was going to play by the rules and liberalize, I think that had us on a path to, to confrontation because China was emboldened. Uh, I think transparent competition is the way to go, right? And, and, to, and to really try to convince Chinese Communist Party leaders over time Hey, you can have enough of your dream without pursuing that dream at the expense of your own people's rights or at our expense in terms of future generations. And, and, and I think that, uh, that to do that, we need, we need a very strong multinational effort, right? I think that, that this, is a, this is a free world. This is an all-world problem. And I'm encouraged, I think, by the, by the emphasis that, that the Biden administration has put on multinational cooperation. I think what China will do and, and what, what, I, you know, what I describe in Battlegrounds is this it is a strategy of co-option, coercion, and concealment. And what China will do is try to divide and conquer, right? And, and I think if we, if we speak with one voice, if we act together to, to maybe take a Hippocratic oath with China, at least first don't do any harm, right? Don't aid and abet, uh, aid and abet the Chinese Communist Party. Focus on our competitive advantages and try to grow those competitive advantages, strengthen our democratic institutions and processes, strengthen uh, the, the fourth estate and, and, uh, and investigative journalism internationally, strengthen you know, rule of law, continue to accentuate the advantages associated with our unchecked entrepreneurialism here in this country, right? While we invest in, make some investments associated with critical technologies, as you see, like in the Endless Frontiers Act, for example. Let me ask you, let me ask you this about the way the United States has managed the Chinese uh, cha uh, challenge. The, uh, you've, um, you, you obviously worked for a president who was criticized for alternately accommodating China and then being recalcitrant about China. I'm wondering if you could talk about your own experience in that administration, the Trump administration, and maybe flip it also and talk about a president over the last 40 years um, who you think got it right, more or less, recognizing that it's, of course, a hard thing to do. Well, you know, I think what you have to do is understand any of these challenges to national and international security on their own terms, view them through the lens of vital interests, craft overarching goals and more specific objectives, right? And then understand the degree to which we, the United States and like-minded partners, have agency and influence over that challenge. That's the kind of framing we did, Jeff, in March of 2017 on China. And what we did with all of these foreign policy challenges that we identified, the first order challenges, was to try to identify the implicit underlying assumptions uh, 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 the, on which previous policies rested and challenge them, right? And, and, uh, and when we did that, we concluded 
that we had clung too long to these flawed assumptions about China and that we needed to affect, I think, the most significant shift in U.S. foreign policy since the end of the Cold War, and that's a shift to a competitive approach uh, to, to China. And we needed to recognize that we have to compete. You know, Jeff, we, you know, we were losing in this competition in large measure because we vacated key arenas of competition based on those flawed assumptions, right? And if you're, you know, if you're not on the pitch, so to speak, you're going to get your ass beat. Right? So a lot of this was, you know, re-entering arenas of competition, but we were determined to do it in, in, in a transparent way and not to foreclose on opportunities for cooperation. But, uh, but I, I, think that, I think that this is an approach I think that's going to carry over into the Biden administration, the next administration after that. It should not be a partisan issue. Let me ask you one more question for a 20-second answer. And this is not fair to you. You'll see the question. Uh, but we are running out of time. The question is, if China tries to make a military move against Taiwan, do you think, A, the United States should intervene militarily? and B, will intervene militarily? Well, I think on the A, I think, I think this, this policy, the, the policy of strategic ambiguity is useful, right? It's useful for two reasons. First of all, it keeps China guessing, right? And what you want to do is deter China by denial for China to conclude, hey, I can't accomplish my objectives for the use of force if you're, if you're Xi Jinping. Uh, but I think it would be a grave mistake for China to think the United States won't intervene, right? We, we've, the U U.S. has intervened in previous Taiwan Strait crises, and uh, North Korea and China made a bad assumption in June of 1950 uh, as well. So, so I, I think it, what is most important is for Taiwan to realize it's in a race now. Taiwan's in a race to develop its own defensive capabilities such that the People's Liberation Army, the Chinese Communist Party, would conclude, hey, we, we can't do this by force. Now, Taiwan also, though, has to harden itself and strengthen itself against Chinese efforts to accomplish its objectives in Taiwan below the threshold of what might elicit a concerted military response. And, and, uh, and, and I think this is where China's failing. You know, I think that, that, that the Taiwanese people have learned vicariously through the fate of, of, the, of Hong, Kong, uh, Hong Kong's population. And, and their resolve is stiffened right, to prevent China from, from subverting uh, uh, tai Taiwan uh, politically uh, and from within and, and economically uh, as well. H.R. McMaster, thank you very much for joining us at the virtual Aspen Ideas Festival. Hey, thanks, Jeff. Great, great to be with you. Aspen Ideas Festival is generously underwritten by Allstate, IBM, MasterCard Center for Inclusive Growth, Mount Sinai, PayPal, Walton Family Foundation, Verizon, and YouTube. Also, thanks to Prudential and the RISE Fund. In addition to the policy programs and the public programs, a pillar of the Aspen Institute is the Youth Engagement Initiative, exemplified by the Aspen Challenge. Take a look at this profile of this impactful program. We really did something remarkable. The um, challenge that we decided to tackle was the Gila Robinson Challenge. It was to connect families to resources to break the cycle of poverty. And we also decided to create a financial literacy curriculum. Composting in our school to create a whole culture of environmental literacy and action. We chose mental health and we decided to find like strategies to help many of the students cope with them. This topic was important to our team because Miami is ground zero for climate change. Some of us are in a low-income income family. Seeing that eight students can do something to help with that, it, it kind of motivates everyone. Not only me, but everyone in the team and even our leaders. It's important for the team as well as our faculty and staff because a lot of people deal with mental health but they don't have resources to deal with them sometimes. Um, here at COPE, there's a lot of teen mothers, so we do deal with emotional stress and anxiety, such as depression as well. Nothing can stop us. Not even a pandemic can stop mm -hmm. us from making a change, and that's what we did. We took that little problem and made something big out of it. So at the end, we 
jump through that roller coaster, the mm -hmm. hurdles and everything, and we, we made a big lasting impact. And that's what we're trying to instill in the girls every day, Absolutely. everywhere you go. It doesn't matter how people look at you. It doesn't mm -hmm. matter what you were, what are you now? And what are you going to become? Exactly. And I think this Aspen experience taught them that they can become so much. I learned that my ideas are as much as valid as anyone else's. I just hope to hear about it when I'm taking my daughter to school, when she's around 16 going to high school and they're talking about mental health. I hope to hear You Matter movement come up in those conversations. My firm belief has always been, if not you, then who? If not now, then when? I think oftentimes what happens is we lose that voice of our young people because we feel like they have to wait. Leadership begins now. For them to make a conscious choice to be a part of the solution to combat something like that is amazing. And in the midst of them doing that, they are rewriting the narrative, right? They are the story because they're writing the story and they're writing it well. Last year, we lost U.S. Supreme Court Justice and champion for women's rights, Ruth Bader Ginsburg. In 2010, she was featured on the Aspen Ideas stage during the afternoon of conversation. I revere the court, I think all of us do, and more than anything else, we want to make sure that we leave it as healthy as we found it. That was one of the many times she spoke on campus and at our offices in Washington, D.C. Maybe hope springs eternal, but I try to be as persuasive as I can uh, with my colleagues. And sometimes I'm successful and sometimes I'm not, but I will continue to, to try. Slavery, tragically, is woven into the DNA of this country. The way we recognize and remember it has a big impact on the way we grow or don't as a nation. Elizabeth Alexander, president of the Mellon Foundation, and Clint Smith of The Atlantic, two scholars who are also poets, explain that how and who we memorialize can determine what lessons we learn from the past and how we move forward together. Thank you, Zinclay, and I'm so excited to be in conversation today with Clint Smith. Hello, Clint. Hi there. How are you? I'm great. I've been looking forward to this conversation because, as we've said to each other before, it feels like we are in a conversation that is very long that we haven't yet had. Mm. Uh, so many incredible points of convergence, so many things to learn, uh, and so, so here we are uh, on leg number one. Indeed. It's good to be here. Um, and so first off, of course, congratulations on your book, How the Word is Passed, New York Times number one bestseller. Yeah. Which is is a, a wonderful, wonderful thing uh, for the book and for you. Um, but also, uh, and I imagine you think this way as well, it's a wonderful thing for the issues that we care about and that you are talking about in the book. Um, so I, I, I want to start out in that place and ask you, what do you think is happening now? What kind of zeitgeist moment are we in where these hard conversations can be had in public uh, about uh, history, memory, and confronting our racial past? Yeah, I, I think certainly we are in a moment where more people are recognizing uh, both our, our proximity to this period of history, uh, and I say both our physical proximity to this period of history in the sense that it is, uh, it is the scars of slavery are embedded in our landscape and topography across this country, uh, and our sort of temporal proximity to this period of history. I say all the time that slavery existed in this country for 250 years and has only not existed for about 150. And so this idea that an institution that existed for a hundred years longer than it hasn't, would have no impact on what the contemporary landscape of inequality looks like, is both morally and intellectually dis disingenuous. And I think that we have more people who are, uh, because of the work of scholars and 
uh, and activists and journalists and writers and artists who are making it so that that past feels closer and more intimate and that we have a more acute sense of how uh, history has shaped our contemporary political, social, and economic infrastructure, and that in order to understand the reason why one community looks one way and another community looks another way, uh, it, it, and to understand that that is the result of people, not the people in those communities, but what has been done to those communities generation after generation, we have to understand the past and the history that has shaped uh, what those spaces look like. And I'd be curious how, how it's shaping your work and how you think about um, so much of what you all are doing at at Mellon, I know that there's a specific effort uh, to think about memory, to think about the, the how how and why we memorialize and what memorialization looks like or even means. Well, yes, we've um, started on our biggest initiative in Mellon's history, which we call the Monuments Project, um, $250 million dedicated over the next several years to think about uh, the built landscape of the United States and how and what it teaches us and to support work that takes any number of different approaches. One would be the creation and commissioning of new memorials. And we think about monuments and memorials in a, in a very, very broad way beyond uh, the uh, rearing general on horseback uh, and uh, going to thinking about collective uh, representations, about um, abstract spaces that don't necessarily have figures, about ephemeral monuments, like some really, really incredible work that's being done um, out of the LA County Museum of Art with the Snapchat folks, where they've commissioned artists to make monuments that you can see through your phone uh, on different in different spaces in LA. So there will be the, the building of, there'll be the recontextualizing of, because I think that some things, uh, if you look at the uh, Robert E. Lee monument uh, in Richmond, I mean, there are so many of them, but the one in right. Richmond and uh, the way that the artist Dustin Klein has done those extraordinary projections onto it of, you know, Sojourner Truth, Harriet Tubman, other freedom fighters who fought against the white supremacy that Lee embodies, um, and also people like George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, to give us a very contemporary sense of the loss of life that white supremacy is still exacting. So that would be, you know, contextualization. Um, research and education is a huge part of it. So just what is the, you know, creative teaching of American history in all of its different forms and not necessarily just in the university classroom, um, though we at Mellon specialize in higher education in colleges, universities and prisons. Um, and then uh, another piece will be about the removal. Uh, of monuments. And again, um, that will come from communities. Uh, you think about the things that, that folks have done in their own communities, like uh, in Selma, the Nathan Bedford Forest uh, statue that was you know, in the midst of Black Selma, I believe in front of a high school. And that when Selma first elected its first Black mayor, they said, this Confederate is not who we want in our midst teaching our children. So it was tremendously uh, controversial uh, and resisted, but eventually it was moved to the nearest Confederate graveyard where I have seen it and where it, along with uh, the other Confederate gra graves, is immaculately tended today. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, there are a lot of different ways of thinking about how the landscape tells its stories and we're just really excited, you know, the time is now to do this on a wide scale and uh, to bring other partners in as well so that we can get as much done as possible in the next in the next stretch of years. It's so interesting because so much of what animated my desire to write How the Word is Passed was, was shaped by uh, watching the Confederate statues come down in my hometown in New Orleans. So watching statues of Robert E. Lee, PGT Beauregard, Jefferson Davis, these leaders of the Confederacy, and thinking about what it meant that I grew up in a majority black city in which there were more homages to enslavers than there were to enslaved people. Mm -hmm. And what does it mean that to get to school, I had to go down Robert E. Lee Boulevard, to get to mm -hmm. the grocery store, I had to go down Jefferson Davis Highway, that my middle school was named after a leader of the Confederacy, that my parents mm -hmm. still live on a street named after somebody who owned 150 enslaved people. Because mm -hmm. as, as your work and the work of Mellon reflects, 
it, like symbols and names and iconography are not just symbols. They are reflective of the stories that societies tell. And those stories embed themselves into the narratives that communities carry. And those narratives shape public policy and public policy shapes the material conditions of people's lives, which isn't to say that, you know, taking down a, a 60 foot tall statue of Robert E. Lee is going to erase the racial wealth gap. But it is a recognition that they that this is part of an ecosystem of ideas and of stories mm -hmm. that shape how we think of and determine what communities, what certain communities do and don't deserve and how we make sense of even what the landscape of a community looks like and how it has come come to be that way. Um, I, I ask myself, you know, one of the things I've been thinking about is um, for the many years I taught at Yale University in what is called the corporation room, the, you know, kind of um, nerve center of the university. Um, there is a statue of the founder of the universe, uh, painting of the founder of the university that, you know, I would go for meetings, I would do my business, I was often the only black person. Um, I was al always, I was, I don't think I was ever there with another black woman. Um, oh, yeah. And there would be this painting and you think he founded Yale and don't think twice. It was years before I looked in the middle of the meeting and saw the chained black slave child at the bottom corner right of the painting as, uh, you know, uh, an exemplar of his wealth and standing. Um, Ooh, so how long was that there? Um, th Is before it still I, there? No, well, no, they actually, they did a really um, smart contextualization. They um, took it down mm. <laughs> and they put it um, in the British Art Center Museum at Yale and did a um, very um, elaborate sort of historical surrounding and learning mm -hmm. uh, project. So if you went and looked it up, looked up Elihu Yale slave right now there, even online, you could hear the historian Jonathan Holloway talking about, uh, about the painting, art historians talking about the painting, contextualizing it in the history of, of Yale and, and, and slavery. Um, and so that to me seemed at a teaching institution exactly the right thing to do with that. Don't put it in the room where we say this is important. This is our most special place, but learn from it because it's, I think it's very important to know uh, the history of, uh, of, of, of all of these places. Um, so, but, but so, and what about you? How do you think of some of those delayed moments where you said like, oh my, my goodness. Yeah. I mean, I, my childhood is full of them. I mean, I think all the time about how one of my fondest memories of my childhood is going to City Park in New Orleans and feeding the ducks and feeding the geese with with my mom. We would freeze the the ends of our bread, our loaves of bread, and and we'd save them over the course of a couple of weeks. And we would go and and feed. You know, for me, it meant like trying to get as close to the geese as possible, and then throwing it once they were like about to bite my hand, and then running away with both uh, equal parts sort of terror and exhilaration um and that that experience that i look back so fond, fondly on was literally done under the shadow of pgt Beauregard, like under the shadow of this statue that sits at the front of uh at the front of city park and i had no notion when i was a kid growing up that this is a man who was a general in an army that fought a war predicated on maintaining and expanding the institution of slavery what does it say about the the priorities of this city or the history of this city in which these men on their horses and on the, with their swords and on their pedestals sit in such prominent places um, and how can that help us make sense of the way that again certain communities have been historically uh not even just under resourced but plundered um both both intellectually um and and materially um and so so i think Part of what happens, you grow up and you learn what all who Robert E. Lee was and who P.G. T. Beauregard was and who Jefferson Davis was, and it's it's angering and it's frustrating, but it's also profoundly clarifying, because I think you you have a much better sense of why our society looks the way that it does today, because you have a better sense of the stories that this country has told itself for so long.
Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, I think about the, the challenges of making those stories material mm -hmm. and making them material in a way that they are available to others. Um, uh, I grew up in Washington, D.C., um, where you live now. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I think about a place where I went all the time um, uh, to what we called Lincoln Park, um, where the statue of um, Lincoln freeing the slave, so, you know, freeing a representative slave, um, a black man kneeling, um, semi-clothed at his feet, um, is one anchor side of the park. And there is um, a, a lot, you know, people are very unhappy with that statue um, now. Um, and the way that I experienced that statue was in a couple of ways. First, it was that when I was, I think, about 10 years old, the statue of Mary McLeod Bethune, the great uh, educator, was placed at the other end of the park with children mm -hmm. around her. So I felt like, okay, well, Mary McLeod Bethune is telling Abraham Lincoln some things. Mm -hmm. You know, she's telling him what, what she thinks about this. She's telling the man to get up. You know, mm -hmm. you're free now. Um, uh, just as she is teaching these children. That was my childhood understanding of seeing uh, this uh, great black woman and this venerated white man. I knew how that conversation had to go right. uh, uh, in real life. But then to, to take it further, um, when I learned that at the dedication of the Lincoln statue that Frederick Douglass himself was part of the dedication, mm. spoke alongside President Ulysses Grant, spoke to most members of Senate and the Supreme Court were there, and then among other things, he criticized the statue. Uh, and, and criticized the kneeling, uh, half-naked, um, formerly enslaved man. You know, it was a great Frederick Douglass, if you go and look at it, it's a great Frederick Douglass speech. Um, so many of them. Uh, exactly. I mean, you know, he usually doesn't fail. Yeah. Um, so what I feel like is all of these layers are so interesting. Um, how could we make those um, visible, knowable, accessible? What do you think about the sort of idea of, uh, and I know a lot of different places have wrestled with this in, in different ways, but uh, instead of taking a statue, uh, an offensive statue down, whether it be to the Confederacy or to um, something controversial like the uh, statue of Lincoln that you mentioned, and, and having another, and not necessarily taking it down, but placing other statues that serve as a different um, perspective or, or mm -hmm. shape a different narrative? Because I asked in part because I went to Maryland's Eastern Shore about a year ago um, for Juneteenth and I went with my family to see, because I wanted to go to the birth, birthplace of Frederick Douglass and I went to the uh, county where he was born and there's a statue of Douglass in front of the courthouse of the county where he was born. And so on one side of the courthouse lawn is a statue of Frederick Douglass and it's very well done. Um, and then on the other side of the of the lawn is a statue dedicated to uh, people from that county who fought for the Confederacy. Mm. And I was it was such an interesting. It was a sort of moment of cognitive dissonance, right, to both have on the same lawn in front of the same courthouse, these two statues that represented not only like differing opinions, but fundamentally different values and 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 sort of uh ideological projects mm -hmm. um uh and and different senses of what freedom was and who freedom was meant for i'm, I'm curious how if there's a sort of institutional way you all are thinking about that or is, does it depend on the local context and so so many different ways to do it and i think that um in part you know relying on the artists to uh, really come up with powerful interpretations in the way that, say, Hank Willis Thomas did with a photograph of a black power Afro pic that was set looming over a statue of Frank Rizzo, mm -hmm. who's, uh, you know, former mayor and police commissioner of Philadelphia, uh, who, you know, really um, governed with a, a, a reign of racist, violent mm -hmm. terror through the, the, you know, mechanism of the police department. So you know, juxtaposition of black power bigger than Frank Rizzo is suddenly that's a conversation. And, you know, only an artist could dream that up. 
But also, I think that um, the beauty of the perspective of black studies and of all of the hyphenated, um, you know, um, ethnic studies and gender studies and LGBTQ studies has been the understanding of simultaneity of perspectives, but not necessarily of weighting things equally. Mm. Because we're up against a landscape that, you know, if, you know, we've actually commissioned, commissioned some research to get really good numbers, but for what we know so far, the representation of women, of people of color, I mean, it, the percentages are minuscule. One of the interesting things of the representation of women in um, public and memorial spaces is that they are usually allegorical or fictive women who never lived. Mm. More statues of Juliet and Alice in Wonderland wow. than of uh, actual flesh and blood American women. Huh. So I think that what that means is one for one is not going to reach parity. One for one is not going to give us the dynamic conversation. This is a moment for an overhaul. Mm. And there are so many different ways um, to do it. Um, we were going to conclude with some poems and um, so much we didn't get to talk about, but another thing that um, you and I share is uh, we are people who think and write in different media, but um, uh, some say uh, the poet part is the heart. Mm -hmm. um, so um, I would love a poem of yours that I love so much if you would read your national anthem for us. I'd be happy to. Your national anthem. Today, a black man who was once a black boy like you got down on one of his knees and laid his helmet on the grass as this country sang its ode to the promise it never kept. And the woman in the grocery store line in front of us is on the phone and she is telling someone on the other line that this black man who was once a black boy like you should be grateful we live in a country where people aren't killed for things like this. You know, she says, in some places, they would hang you for such a blatant act of disrespect. Maybe he should go live there instead of here so he can appreciate what he has. And then she turns around and sees you sitting in the grocery store cart surrounded by lettuce and yogurt and frozen chicken thighs. And you smile at her with your toothless gum smile. And she says you are the cutest baby she has ever seen and tells me how I must feel so lucky to have such a beautiful baby boy. And I thank her for her kind words, even though I should not thank her, because I know that you will not always be a black boy, but one day you will be a black man, and you may decide your country hasn't kept its promise to you either. And this woman, or another like her, will forget you were ever this boy, and they will make you into something else and tell you to be grateful for what you've been given. Thank you so much. Thank and you. I would love to hear a poem from you, a favorite of mine, uh, Apollo. Yes, I was so interested that you chose that one. That's a that's an oldie. <laughs> yes, a classic, as they say. <laughs> um, well, this poem is called um, Apollo, uh, and I think that you know we always live in history. Um, uh, every single one of us, whether we're aware of it at the time or not. Apollo. We pull off to a road shack in Massachusetts to watch men walk on the moon. We did the same thing for 321 blast off and now we watch the same men bounce in and out of craters. I want a Coke and a hamburger. Because the men are walking on the moon, which is now irrefutably not green, not cheese, not a shiny dime floating in a cold blue the way I'd thought. The road shack people don't notice. We are a black family not from there, the way it mostly goes. This talking through static, bouncing in space boots tethered to cords is much stranger, stranger even than we are. Thank you so much for sharing that. Thank you for asking. Thank you for the conversation. It's been beautiful and it shall be continued. It's always too quick, but I know we'll have many more. Yes, thank you.
We would like to thank all of our generous underwriters, the organizations that make this digital festival possible. In the middle of a pandemic year, the U.S. had one of our most divisive elections. We asked some of our past Aspen Ideas speakers and fellows, what can we do to strengthen democracy? Make voting easier for everyone and involve more women and young people in democratic processes. Coupling democracy with accountability, focusing on outputs and not just inputs. We have to make voting easier for everyone. We need to reimagine and reinvest in news gathering and reporting at the community level. So when someone says they don't believe the media, they'll be saying they don't believe Jane, who lives in their town, and they know. Strengthening unions. I think that ranked choice voting, which allows people to vote for multiple candidates in order of preference, is one of the more effective tools we have to moderate our politics. It makes it harder for extremist candidates to win because they get fewer second choice votes. Democracy is under attack due to partisan extremists. The solution is to teach our constitution, what it means and why it binds us. The constitution is bipartisan and points the way towards solutions. A new commitment to civic education is critical. We need to bolster the value of science and fact-based stories and create a better unified education system which includes natural, outdoor classrooms for everyone, not just those who can afford it. Term limits on Congress. Reach millennials and Gen Z where they are, online, with trusted sources for historical context and factual analyses. Inspire them now to be shaping the nation its 250th anniversary. Hopefully we will see a return to consensus building and compromise. Otherwise, I am worried. Focus all of our power on addressing racial and economic inequality. Going to school is no easy feat. There's studying, awkward cafeteria seating, not to mention the ups and downs of classroom socializing. Unfortunately, classroom communication is too often a one-way street, and students may feel they can't be honest about their needs and feelings. Along, a student-to-teacher tech that helps facilitate honest interactions was launched just a few days ago. Priscilla Chan explains how the digital tool came to be and how it can help kids work through trauma. Priscilla, I'm thrilled to be here with you at the Aspen Ideas Festival. Uh, and we're going to get a chance today to talk about teacher-student connections, which you know so much about, both from your work in the foundation and the school you've started. So I'm eager to hear your thoughts. The theme uh, of Aspen this year is American Futures. And after everything that students and families and all of us have been through over this past year and a half, how do you see the future of education? Yeah. Um, first, let me say it's an incredible honor to be here talking with you, Linda. Um, your research at Stanford and at the Learning Folly Institute has shaped so much of what we do at CZI. And uh, honestly, your tireless advocacy for an education system that's actually focused on the need of the whole child is helping us all transform schools. Um, but with regards to this past year, I want to make it very clear that the pandemic has laid bare what educators and parents already knew, that teaching and learning don't happen in a vacuum. There's so many factors that go into ensuring that a child can reach their full potential. For example, do they have an adult mentor that believes in them? Are their social, emotional, and physical needs being met? We believe that these are the key questions that we have to consider if we want to set our kids up to succeed both inside and outside the classroom. And as someone who started their career as a teacher before becoming a pediatrician, I've seen the importance of really making sure that you take a holistic approach. Every time I would see a student who was, was not engaged in, the, in school or was because they were new, I, I would think, did they skip breakfast? Are they, did they get a good night's sleep? Um, are they worried about something? And every one of those moments would be a reminder that what goes on outside the classroom 
affects what happens inside. And that's where our vision at CZI begins. We believe in a whole child approach to education, one that honors the humanity of each teacher and student. We also recognize the role that systemic racism has played in historically creating an unequal education system that we've all inherited and the role it continues to play in really cementing the inequitable outcomes that we see in education. Um, and we need to change that. Until we confront that reality and start providing school administrators and teachers with the resources that they need to equitably meet the whole child of er the whole child needs of every student, we're not going to be able to do the work. Yeah, I think that you know, as a state board president in California, we are launching you know restorative return to school. Uh, looking forward to a summer of joy right now as schools are reconnecting, and I feel like there's a lot of acceptance of the idea that the whole child has to be front and center, that we have to equally support student well-being and academic success. But there is a debate about this in some circles about what's most important. And I just wonder, what is your perspective on that question as a parent, an educator, a pediatrician? Uh, what do you think is most important? Well, it's fantastic seeing so many families and care providers getting engaged because they've had a front row seat to education and what we have, what our strengths are and where our weaknesses are over the past year. Um, but with regards to this choice, this debate on wellness or academic success, to me, that's a false dichotomy um, that we either have to finish, focus on unfinished learning or student well-being. We have to tackle both because they're interlocking. But first of all, let's I want to take a step back and just walk through the magnitude of multiple overlapping traumas that our students have faced. Their day-to-day -day lives were completely bl blown up. Disruptions to school, work, life, incredible economic insecurity, and loss of friends and loved ones, in particular in our black, brown, and indigenous populations. And so when our teachers and students actually return to the classroom this fall, those traumatic experiences they're not magically disappearing. They're coming, they're coming back into the classroom on the shoulders of our teachers and students. And that's why we need that trauma-informed practice to welcome the, the, the teachers and students back in, in a way that fosters trust through building relationship, building a sense of safety through the consistency and predictability that a school can provide and a sense of control through the opportunities that they can choose and choice in their everyday um, experiences. I think there's that human side where we walk through the day of the life of, but if I put on my pediatrician hat, you know this, um, when students are under stress, their cortisol levels rise. And when cortisol levels are high, their working memory gets super limited and saturated. And that means their brains are literally not ready to learn until we can attenuate or bring down their cortisol levels. And uh, so the best laid lesson plan is going to fall flat until we can address that. But the good news is if we actually treat this as an important first tier goal, we can do something about this. Students have built incredible resilience over the past year. They've dealt with this oftentimes better than adults have. And so we have an opportunity to tap into that resilience, let them see that resilience and actually have it be something that gives them strength, both in the near term and the long term. Yeah, that is so well said. And you know, uh, we have so much evidence, as you said, from neuroscience about how students learn more effectively when they're calm and when they're trust in a trusting relationship and feel positively. The social and emotional side of learning, the supports and uh, lessons that uh, accompany that kind of learning are really the pathway to academic achievement rather than a distraction from academic achievement. So I think uh, that's just a critically important thing. And the other thing we know, of course, is that relationships are one of the most important antidotes to trauma that when kids have experienced trauma uh, and, and uh, they are looking for ways to recenter, those strong relationships really matter. 
Uh, so I would love to ask you uh, how you think teachers can integrate and invest in relationships um, in their classroom, sort of as an ongoing practice. Yeah, I think that's exactly the right question. How can we be, all be intentional about this? Yeah, Because I think we can all think about that wonderful teacher, that wonderful mentor in our lives that changed your life forever. I can. Um, for me, that's Mr. Long and Mr. Swanson. Um, but to make sure that we aren't just waiting for teachers with the right bandwidth or um, who've studied this or um, or have time for this in their day, we have to be intentional about making sure that every teacher has the resources and tools to do this. Because honestly, this is the reason why the majority of our teachers are teachers. It, it is rewarding and brings joy into their lives too. And it makes a huge difference for our students. Um, and so we must, we need to focus on how do we, how do we do this intentionally? How do we do this systematically? And how do we lean on the research that already exists in social emotional learning? And when we were thinking through this challenge last year at CZI, we started thinking about how do we bring together the best practice from research, teachers, students, parents, and to build a tool to make this easier to build in the science of relationships. And this is where technology can help too. One of the ways that we're working on this is by support, supporting our nonprofit partner, Gradient Learning, um, and working alongside their t teachers and students to build along. Along is a free digital reflection tool that's designed to help teachers make every student feel seen and understood. I think of it as a virtual check-in that aims to strengthen that student-teacher relationship. It's a tool that provides a place outside of the classroom full of peers where a student can really connect authentically with their teacher one-on-one. -on -one. And along, the teacher gets to choose from a library of re reflection questions that are informed by the latest research on the science of relationships. Um, and these are important because th these are what helps us get past those one word answers that we've all gotten before. And when the teachers use the tool, they ask students ref to reflect on a time, maybe when they succeeded, where they f had feared that they might have fallen short. Another example might be asking a student to think critically about how they might deal with stress or manage their time. Or in another day, just what are you grateful for? And then the really cool thing is, students get to choose to respond in their own way over video, text, or audio. And in that process, the teacher gets an important chance to get to know their student and truly see them for their whole selves their source of pride, their worries, what their lives are outside of the classroom. And as the students get to discuss their own journeys more deeply, they get to develop their own important life skills and develop a really strong sense of safety, connection in their classroom, which hopefully leads to stronger engagement, like being more comfortable speaking up on an issue in the classroom. Yeah, all of those things. That's so good. And, you know, um, when I think about the roles that administrators and policymakers can play in enabling that kind of environment in the classrooms, you know, one part of it is, too, to uh, think of the school year coming as going slow to go fast. That is, let's take the time to build those relationships. Let's build those trusting communities in the classroom. I personally don't want teachers to feel you know, like they have to rush in and start teaching, you know, the standards on day one that uh, kids are not going to be ready to uh, accept and work with in this kind of a uh, relationship with trust and, and um, confidence and a sense of um, positive purpose. So uh, making room for what you just described is going to be a really important part of recovery uh, and building back stronger. Uh, I think that's such a key piece. Well, you know, you mentioned the disproportionate impact of the pandemic, particularly on communities of color. And we need to be able to think about uh, the return to school, if you will, uh, and prioritizing equity as students are returning to in-person classrooms. 
Uh, what would you like to be sure educators are thinking about as we build, and policymakers for that matter, as we're building an equitable return to school? For me, an equitable education system and an equitable return to school starts with getting every child access to what he or she needs to be successful. Um, for example, an equitable education system should also have in their sights how to help students um, feel ready to learn through supporting healthcare and nutrition and how those are important pillars in becoming a healthy, productive citizen. Um, one of our partner, partners called the Fuji's Academy in both Georgia and Ohio comes to mind. They put a focus on identity and culture. Um, most of their students are refugees while also at the same time connecting students and families with access to me medical services and health insurance. Those are, it both anchors a student into their community, their context, while making sure that they're cared for. Um, and then you have to include a learning environment that's centered around relationships. We have to make sure that students' emotional needs, including their sense of belonging, are being met. Research shows us that when students don't feel a sense of belonging, it actually creates a neurological barrier to learning. And you know this at, um, in your leadership in the Science of Learning and Development Alliance in the National Commission on Social Emotional and Academic Development. Um, to, you've been instrumental in making sure that this research actually comes back to the classroom. Um, and then when you do succeed at that, when you do ensure that a student has a sense of belonging connection, like having a mentor to help them feel seen, heard, and valued, they're equipped to succeed. Studies have found that students with mentors are 55% more likely to enroll in college and 130% more likely to hold leadership positions than students without mentors. And so having that strong relationship is a key driver to learning and development. Well said. Uh, I just want to thank you so much for all that you bring to this conversation and to the uh, work that we're doing in the world. You know, the experience of having been a parent, a teacher, a pediatrician, a philanthropist, a school f founder, uh, brings uh, just so much knowledge and understanding to the task that we have together. Uh, and I'm inspired to take the next steps uh, following this example. Thank you so much, Priscilla. Thank you. Aspen Ideas Festival is generously underwritten by Allstate, IBM, MasterCard Center for Inclusive Growth, Mount Sinai, PayPal, Walton Family Foundation, Verizon, and YouTube. Also, thanks to Prudential and the RISE Fund. Thank you for joining us this evening. There's only one day left of the 2021 Aspen Ideas Festival, and we want you to get the most of it. Start with our breakout sessions every hour on the hour, which you'll find listed at aspenideas.info forward slash 2021. We'll talk about empathy, misinformation, education, and police reform, as well as psychedelic therapy and cryptocurrency. Get a good night's sleep. We've got a lot to think about tomorrow.